Well, I have one of the first guests on the show back again with me today, Drew Curtis of FARC.com, RAGBRAI co-veteran and uh, former governor, or not governor, well, former, what do they call that when you actually run the for a <laughs> candidate? Gubernatorial candidate, which is the only time anybody uses that <laughs> word ever, because it sounds like somebody, like a peanut farmer, you know, oh, I'm a gubernatorial yeah. candidate. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, you, are you a peanut farmer as well? Uh, I, I haven't tried it yet, but I mean, I could probably give it a shot later today. I've, I was going to plant some tomatoes, but I've got some peanuts around here somewhere. Let's see what happens. Yeah. Well, now that you're a time traveler, you should be able yes. to, you should be able to know whether or not it's going to, it's going to work out for you at this point. I should just go into the future and see if it worked rather than plant. And then I could save myself some work. Yeah. Do you want to, do you want to explain why, why you're tra a time traveler or you're perceived to be a time traveler at this point? Yeah, so that's actually a true statement, um, which probably sounds ridiculous. But um, so what happened was, is that uh, it's you know, the shortest version I could possibly give you is, is that it was a five year slow roll joke. And I pulled the punchline on May 1st of uh, 2020. What happened was, is that on New Year's Eve of 2015, I'd noticed that for several years in a row on social media, people had been complaining about the previous year saying that year sucked. It's it's that was terrible. And it was like, it kind of sucked for everybody. But if you think about it, it wasn't, if it was good year for you, you probably weren't going to yell about it. Cause I mean, it's the same thing I always say. It's like, if people dislike something, they don't tend to talk about it, but if they hate it, they'll mention it. But if they like it, they never say it because you know, we just assume that status quo. So I posted a thing joking because I would just like to see the year end going, man, things finally got better, which should probably happen in 2021, by the way. But at any rate, I don't know how it can get much worse. I mean, yeah, every time I say that, then we get like murder hornets and giant asteroids. And uh, today it was uh, actually in the news cycle uh, 10 minutes ago, uh, mutant toads down in Florida. I don't think that's quite a plague. I mean, if as long as they stay in Florida, it'll be fine. I think um, Florida but, is just a plague in general. <laughs> yeah, they really are. We should do Bugs Bunny had the right idea. Have you ever seen that cartoon? Where he cuts off Florida. <laughs> cuts off Florida and it just floats away. Yeah, that we should get on that. Um, but at any rate, so I posted a thing saying here, and let me just pull this up because I actually have Twitter up right now because I, I did something this morning that went viral. Um, I doubt it's going to go as far as the last one did. Um, but anyway, so my time traveler treat was, so 2015, December 31st in the evening. And by the way, I was drunk when I did this. Um, I said, admission, I am a time traveler from 2020. Enjoy 2016 because it's as good as it gets for a while. Now, what's really funny is, is that people are not paying attention. Um, well, first of all, the political bots can't figure out what to do with this. Like they don't have a lot to say about it. Occasionally the closest political thing I can get is somebody said, oh, that's just a political statement because Trump won. Well, not in 2015, he didn't. So hell, I didn't even think he was going to win. So there you go. But what happened was, is that, so a lot of bad things have happened since then. And it, arguably, like I keep telling my kids, luck is like, if you think you have bad luck, that's all you're going to see. So I keep telling them, don't think you have bad luck and don't think you have a bad year. Sometimes you can empirically have a bad year. Like, you know, if you get an arm cut off in an accident or something, okay, sure. Or if there's a pandemic going on and right around May 1st, I woke up that morning, remembered this tweet and retweeted it. And I said, this tweet aged well. That was literally it. And as of this moment right now, and it's not moving that much, 128,000 retweets, 665,000 likes. And let's see, let's, let's check out the analytics here. 38 million impressions. And that's just on Twitter because what happened was is people started screenshotting it and then loaded it up to uh, like uh, TikTok, uh, which that went absolutely insane. Uh, TikTok and all the other platforms, basically Instagram and whatever. And it keeps like even today, my middle kid went nuts because one of the meme channels that he watches on YouTube featured it today. And it's like June 3rd. This is like, I did this 33 days ago. So it's, uh, it's been really funny, but what happened was, is that my, uh, my, my Twitter feed is filled up with initially everybody pretty much assumed I was joking, but now I'm getting tons of follows, especially when it hits a country, like it hit Indonesian, whatever Indonesian TikTok is like, uh, like two days ago and everybody pops up and they start asking questions about like, what's going on in the future. And it's a lot of you know, I, I kind of want to tell them everything will be okay because it's a lot of, you know, when will things be normal? And then am I ever going to have a girlfriend or a boyfriend or am I ever <laughs> going to be famous? Um, like that kind of stuff. And unfortunately, like I'll respond to them if like they've got an older Twitter account. But a lot of them don't because I think they came straight over from TikTok. They're all like in high school. Like they want to know when like the school's going to start back up again because they miss school. So I figure, you know, due to, you know, legal issues, I should probably not talk to any of them. But uh, the most common question I keep getting asked is, 
And actually, I mean, I'll ask you if you can guess it. And the problem is that you just have to go weird. Like, what would you think it would not be? Because it's it's probably unguessable, but it's also kind of dumb. At the same time, I could understand why teenagers might be interested in this. But it, it's if I could ask a time traveler one question, this ain't it. Oh, what so do you, you think it is? You want me to guess it? Mm, I, and guess dumb stuff because that's the only way you're going to get it right. It's nothing you could possibly <laughs> predict. Oh, God. I mean, first. Well, like, what do you think they're into? And it crosses international lines. Because it's that common. It's like so everybody in other countries wants to know this too. Uh, I'm thinking of like normal human stuff like – like uh, I, It's not that. It's not <laughs> It's not normal human stuff? No, All no right. it's literally it's like if you were 16 and I don't know. What do 60-year-olds want to know about that's in the future? Um, it's still not enough of a hint by the way. But it, I'm trying to get you closer to the finish. Oh, man. And it's dumb. It's really dumb. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Man, what, do, what did I want to know when I was 16? Am I ever going to have friends? <laughs> <laughs> this wouldn't be a question you could ask them no. because it's something that hadn't happened until recently. Okay. And it's probably totally off your radar. I <laughs> Honestly, I'm like, I'm thinking through <laughs> this and I'm like, there's literally nothing that makes sense that's not normal. Like, I'm, I'm thinking, what am I going to be when I grow up? Yeah, oh. I get a lot of those, yeah, but I'm talking like the, the dumb one. Like, what, what's the, I mean, it's a total waste of a question. Like, if you had one wish, like, what would you wish for? Not this, but okay. they would. All right, my 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 my, my I, ah, that's not even dumb though. I was like, where am I going to live? But that's not dumb. Yeah, come up with three dumb ones, and then uh, we'll yeah. see if you can get in the right. neighborhood. They're not dumb enough. The ones I'm coming up with are just lame. They're not dumb. I was thinking like uh, like when am I going to get married? But that's yeah, not that, that's, that's not dumb that's enough. Not a, um, it's got to be dumb. dumber. <laughs> Give me an example of a dumb question. So other dumb questions I'll be getting asked are mostly about when sports teams are going to win. The mm. next time, uh, the number one question for the number one sport and sports team is when is Arsenal going to win the EPL, which is hilarious because I don't know if you know much about the EPL, but Arsenal is essentially the Boston Red Sox. They're always competitive, but they rarely pull off a win. And I yeah. think they finally did get a win in the last couple of years. The question nobody asks is when is Manchester United going to win the premiership? And the reason is because they win it every three years. So if, if you're a Man United fan, you don't care. Yeah. You know it's going to happen. So you're not asking that question. So it's along the lines of that dumb. Okay. Oh, my God. I'm really like hmm. – I know. It's hard. Yeah, It's hard getting I, that dumb. I you mean, have to, like, trying to you, have to, you have to be naturally that dumb is the problem. Is, is it <laughs> – uh, give, me, give me one more hint. Is it in like technology, entertainment? Uh, entertainment. Entertainment? Oh, it pro- 16. Oh, yeah. oh, it's probably like are the Jonas Brothers going to get back together? Or something. Damn close. You are right in the neighborhood. Shit. Not the Jonas Brothers. But uh, it is who. <laughs> it's, Who's going to get back together? <laughs> who is going to get back together? And think international. Who, who's popular internationally that's currently not together right now? And they may be completely off your radar, but it's is it like you're, a K- you're right there. Is it like a K-pop band of some sort? Not K-pop. It's British. British. Honestly, I, I'm having a hard time thinking of any British bands that I know. That's, yeah, well, you probably paid no attention to these guys. <laughs> all right I know I do. it's one direction they want to know oh number, yeah yeah number one question yeah. i get asked they want to know when is one direction or are they going to get back together again and i responded and man this thing went nuts i said as soon as one of them runs out of money <laughs> <laughs> which is how it always works right so yeah. i'm gonna look like a goddamn genius because that's totally what's gonna happen one of them's gonna get like a, a meth habit or something or he's gonna you know messy divorce or something like that and that's that's when the reunion tour happens is when when one of them runs out of money and i'm gonna look like a genius again guys we should get the band back together why what's going on i just really miss you guys and then you see in the paper the next yeah. day he's like filing for bankruptcy <laughs> yeah, it's like oh here it comes well that's why like monty python did like a road tour recently because uh, john cleese got divorced for the fourth time without a prenup <laughs> and basically <laughs> he needed some more income so they went on the road so there you go. So that's when that – and it, what's funny is is that like like the answers I'm able to give and because I read FARC all the time and this is relevant to the reason we even started talking about this is that I read everything in the news cycle every day and I've seen this stuff play out over and over again for 20 years. So I have a much better prediction rate than probably anybody else other than a time traveler would have. So here's another example. Uh, the, one of the number one non-questions, non-stupid questions I get is will there be a vaccine – and when are things returning to normal? And I've been saying September and December. And they're all like, what? So, well, here's the thing. All the stuff I've been reading is, um, first of all, there's not one vaccine being worked on. There's hundreds, and it's a race. And whoever wins this race it becomes a billion-dollar company if they're not already. Huge damn deal. So there's hundreds of vaccines coming. 
Um, and there's a bunch of companies that are publicly traded that are predicting September. And that matters because if they didn't have a reasonable reason to state that publicly, they can't legally say that. Um, so there's been a bunch. So, well, I mean, maybe they'll all miss, but it sounds like public companies that would be fined by the FCC for getting it wrong have been saying September. And then um, there's a little bit of a ramp up, basically. The upshot is they got to produce all that stuff. But I, I kid you not, this morning, Dr. Fauci, in an article that aired overnight, actually went public and said he thinks there will be 100 million doses of something by December. So again, like I'm not a time traveler and neither is he, but I'm I'm informed. So yeah. I'm able to like, you know, would you ask me like, do I know that? No. What's most likely? September and December, because that's what all the evidence points towards. So that's it. I'm not really a time traveler. I'm just a really good guesser. <laughs> so if you had really one, good. if you had one question, you would ask a time traveler. What? Jesus, I can't even speak anymore. <laughs> if you had yeah. one question, you could ask a time traveler. What would it be? Yeah, that's a good question, actually. I mean, the main one would be, what the hell are you doing in 2020? Because <laughs> I'm getting a lot of that. That one's coming up a lot. And I keep telling people, it's like, well, I said I traveled back from 2020. So technically, I was escaping. There's actually a really good meme going around where it's uh, it's uh, the doc from uh, Back to the Future talking to Marty and explaining to him why he should never, never ever go to 2020. <laughs> because... That's that's not where you want to end up. So I guess if, if they showed up today in real life, they'd be like, "What are you doing here?" Other than that, uh, you know, I don't know because the problem is is that it's it's more problematic if it's possible. If uh, you think about it, so I guess what I would ask, and this is sort of this is an important question only to me, but whether or not time travel works like it does in the Marvel superhero universe, or it does in other sci-fi things, and here's here's why this matters. So in a lot of sci-fi books and writings and whatever. If you go back in time, you are coexisting in the same space so you can change time. Like that's like yeah, Back to the Future, you know, like the whole plot of Back to the Future is Marty screwed up and he's accidentally, you know, uh, off his chances of being born. And so, uh, you know, he's fading out of the picture. And so that's the question. is: Does it work like that or does it work like in the Marvel Universe where you just create an alternate timeline? So you haven't changed time like your timeline still exists. And I just kind of want to know, because if time travel exists and you can't change your timeline, Great. Like, let's do yeah. it. Yeah. You know, like, all right. I could, you know, no harm, no foul, I guess. But, you know, if, if you do change it, man, you better be damn careful because of the butterfly effect is going to really screw some stuff up otherwise. Yeah. And by the way, let me take a pause here real quick. I have to run upstairs and you can keep this in the podcast, by the way. I smell popcorn. And the reason why that's a problem is because our microwave doesn't work. Oh, uh, which means one of my kids might have tried to make popcorn on the stove. And I just got to make sure the house isn't on fire. So let me go check that out and I'll be right back. Uh, take about five minutes. So yeah, no worries. And if they actually successfully made popcorn, I'm bringing it with me. <laughs> so that burn. was a good call. It was burning. <laughs> so yeah, no, no flames. Um, I recently taught Chance how to make um, pizza from dough balls in a cast iron pan. Yeah. And uh, the reason you do that is because it makes the bottom crispy and he likes pizza. So he was making it. And of course, I, so I'm just to give you an idea of the logistics of this, I'm down in the basement, okay? Like I got to walk through like a very large main room, the one you guys crashed in when you guys were visiting, yeah. that thing, up, up a flight of stairs and then across the kitchen into the living room or into the, or across the, sorry, across the dining room into the kitchen. And I could smell that all the way from here. And I was like, dude, what are you doing? He's sitting on the couch right next to it, just watching TV. And I was like, what's going on? So yeah, um, still might be edible though. It might just be really well done. I guess we'll see. But anyway, nothing caught on fire, luckily. So we're good to go. That's good. I'm <clears throat> That would that would ruin everything if your house burned down right now. I mean, it would be yeah. It would make I mean, 2012, 20 is already going to be the worst year. So <laughs> just pile it on at this point, I guess. So did did you finish the question? Uh, what would you ask? You ask if there's parallel a parallel universe or if there's a singular timeline, right? Exactly. Am I changing my own history by doing anything, or am I cool? Because if the if it's the Marvel way, um, you're it's a different timeline and you're cool. But you still might be changing your version of yourself's history but it ain't you so you can just keep on going so that the the reason that this kind of matters right now is I, we were talking about this before like the whole you know the future thing and whatnot um is i haven't recorded anything in like six months and talking about kind of getting started again getting back on the quote unquote horse <laughs> yeah. and yeah i was i kind of wanted to hear your because i think this is going to be very relevant right now with everything going on with you know COVID, people are going to be going back to work at some point. People are going to have, you know, some people have businesses that have closed. Some people have businesses that have been shut down. And it's I don't know. I've been thinking a lot about it lately, like what it means to actually 
like get started again. And from what it sounded like, you have some relevant experience with uh, hitting some bumps in the road and having to pick some pick some stuff up and put it back together again. Yeah, totally. Because like even when you're doing a thing, like I've been doing Fark now for 21 years, and even when you do that, I mean, thing you still hit. Like this is the fourth extinction event that we've gone through for digital media in the last 20 years. And I mean, nobody knows how often that cadence is, but it seems like usually when a recession hits or something else that like, you know, that what happens is advertising dollars just kind of blow the hell up and then it goes away. And that's a case in point. That's exactly what happened. In fact, um, I knew this was coming. I was predicting it anyhow, because ad dollars always drop when there's a recession anyway. And so I kind of figured there was going to be one this year. I didn't know the pandemic was going to kick it off. But the minute that happened, Um, So to give you an idea of a timeline, the first week of April, before most places had shut down, I started calling friends of mine and saying, hey, get to the store, buy toilet paper and coffee because people are stupid and anything else you can't live without for about, you know, a month and a half because they're going to shut it all down. And at the time that I said this, that was an unbelievable statement. I had a lot of people push back and go, you're kidding. And I was like, no, I wish I was, but just get to the store. And if I'm wrong, well, you don't have to buy that stuff for the next year, right? So at any rate, what happened was is that it didn't. It wasn't until probably the last week of April. So middle of April is when most places shut down. It was state by state slowly. It was first California, New York, then Kentucky, strangely enough, where I live. So right after all that started happening, then the unemployment claims, the first week that the bad unemployment came, claims came in was a Thursday, and they were off the charts. And then almost immediately, advertisers started pulling spends, which, I, which usually happens. And it dropped down to below 50%, which is really bad. That's like 2009 bad. And that's a, that's a problem because, you know, if that's substantially where most of your revenue comes from, and in our case, it's like 50, 50, uh, you got to cover somehow. So basically you just start scrambling. And so the thing is, is though, although I'm not starting over, I'm in a completely new environment, which is almost exactly the same thing as starting over. In fact, it's a little bit worse because everything you built up until this point is not built to handle the current environment. So it's even worse because starting over would mean at least you could you know, start from scratch and build into the current environment. Um, but luckily, like I said, this has happened before. And what we do every time this happens is, is you switch to a subscription model. And it's not something digital media, other media companies have had to do because they were always able to rely on their print media and their broadcast media before this. Now they can't. And everybody's scrambling. We just switched over to a subscriber drive. And I was like, look, guys, here's the deal. We got enough money for three more weeks. Uh, we need a couple thousand people to subscribe. Let's get on this. And they they responded. It was really, really amazing. So yeah, it's just one of those deals where you kind of, you kind of just do what you have to, man. You know, it's like, um, uh, and that it, the only thing, the worst thing you could do is not take a shot at anything. I mean, just sit on the couch. That's and, and part of the reason why is because I was talking to some entrepreneurs in Silicon Valley about this. And here's another interesting thing that happens in really dire downturns. And I saw this happen twice already. I got to see it once happen in 2000 and again in 2009. There are these companies that start coming together during these sharp downturns that are kind of like the entrepreneurship version of the super group, you know, the rock band made up of all of these other guys. Like That doesn't happen when things are good. It happens when people's companies crash and all of a sudden there's all this talent available. If your company can survive its way through that or team up with a bunch of other people of the same caliber in ways that you weren't considering doing before – some of the most amazing companies come out of these downturns. And I guarantee you, like, I don't know who they are. I can't predict that. But they're assembling right now. And I would keep an eye out for, like, if you saw a company found it any time after March of 2020, I'd take a real hard look at that one because that means there is a talent pool over there that's pretty amazing. Yeah, because they got cut from other jobs or things just kind yeah. of, yeah. So. Well, especially if they started in April because who did that? Nobody, except for desperate people. Yeah. And, and that's a really good indication because that means their talent level is probably – way higher than it should have been, which usually means good successful outcomes. So keep it, that's, that's a marker to look for going forward. Hmm. So when, when this stuff happens, I mean, maybe zooming out a little bit from less on the tactical side of things, but maybe on a personal level, what do you do when you, like, so when FARC has these extinction moments or when you maybe personally have something happen where it's like, all right, shit, this thing, you know, we, it's going to require a change what do you do? How do you handle that? Yeah. So what I do is, and this is just a talent I have. If you don't have it, um, find somebody who does because, uh, I got it done in a, it was a really cool 
inventory of business related skills. And I can't remember what the hell the thing was called because they give it to us in business school back when I thought it was a lot of bunk. Now I think there might be something to it. And it basically says that there are nine business related skills. Like, you know, they've all got a limit. The two I'm good at are I come up with a lot of ideas and I'm good at identifying good ones, which is a really unusual combination. Most people don't have that. You're either one or the other. And idea people, and this actually changed my mind on this, this test that they gave because I'm thinking it's just kind of garbage. And I'm like, I have ideas all the time and most of them are stupid. And they said, no, that's normal. Idea people, that's it. Like they have thousands of ideas and most of them are crap. Yeah. Um, the trick is teaming up with somebody who can identify it. In my case, it turns out that's also me. Um, <laughs> so what I do, and like I said, if you're not, if neither of those things are your skill, I'm a big proponent in borrowing other people's skills. If you know somebody like that, like I know a couple of people that if I say, hey, give me some ideas about blah, 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 they'll start spouting them off. Just one, two, three, four. So find somebody who can do that for you. And then what I basically, uh, to answer your question more directly, I, I basically start coming up with plans, um, you know, like evasive action members. Like here's what we have to do in order to keep running. Like, uh, so my quick list is we need to sign up more ad networks, more effectively manage our ad stack, which is something we're working on in the background. Keep an eye out for Ad companies in particular, a lot of them will offer a guaranteed payout because they're trying to gain traction. And ones that have money but not traction are probably cleaning up right now. So, you know, go find those. Then on the subscriber side, it was flog the subscription, uh, talk to the community directly and explain to them what the problem is. One of the ideas that popped up later on was is we offered a specific pandemic only badge that you could have in your profile, basically to just get us over the hump because the subscriptions went up. Ads have not recovered to the level that we needed to, like not really close, but they are at least trending in that direction. And so we needed another bump. And so I rolled that one out the door, basically. And then at that point, it's explore a possible sale of the company, which is not something I want to do. But that takes three to six months to spin up. And the last thing you want to do is to try to sell when you're going bankrupt, because that's a bad negotiating position to be in. So, so you got to, so I, I started working on all of those things the same week in April simultaneously, every single one of them, and then coming up with more ideas and you just push everything forward and then keep an idea on anything's gaining traction and then go, go that way. That's basically you just do everything you can. Yeah. How quickly do you, so I, I have, I feel like I have a comment about that, but then I was wondering how quickly do you bail on something? If you like, how quickly can you tell if it's not working? I don't know how to tell if it's not working, but yeah, you get a, a sort of just a second sense about this after a while. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, very quickly. Um, in fact, uh, the problem is, is that, um, especially that's part of the reason why you want to roll like a dozen of these, because that'll kind of solve itself. Like any, cause one of them's probably going to start taking off. I mean, if none of them do, then come up with better ideas. But what happens is after a few days of working on it, it becomes pretty clear which one is, and it'll always surprise you. It'll never be the one you would have predicted. You're like, Oh, actually this thing is going. And then you just go in harder basically. So you, you, you eliminate the ones that are, you, it, if like, for example, can't, if you can't tell if it's working, that's still a failure. Yes. Um, so uh, yeah, you, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it isn't necessarily a failure, but that's why you want to fill your plate up. So you don't have time enough to chase these things that aren't working. And also too, you can come back around to them later is the other thing. You could also put them on pause. That's the other way to look at it. You don't have to just scrap an initiative completely. You can just like, for example, um, juicing ad networks on our stack side, having no impact whatsoever. It eventually will. Yeah. So we'll, we'll get back around to that, but right now it's not doing anything. So we're just going to let that one go away for a while. Yeah. So I, I was thinking, uh, so the comment I wanted to make was I do, I don't know, I, I write stuff on different, different platforms and I was doing like this little test to see like how many, like if I write something every day for, I don't even remember how long I did it, maybe a month or something, like how many new followers can I get? How, like right. what happens? And I remember I found myself writing a bunch of stuff that I was like, I didn't really give a shit about. It, it just felt like I was, I was like, here's a topic, write something down, push it out and it's done. And I remember I wrote something and I was like, this is unspectacular. This is probably like the least effort I've ever put into writing something and publishing it. And then I like log into my account the next morning and I have like several thousand like upvotes on it. And I was yeah. like, what the hell? And then next thing you know, it's got like, there's over like five, like I think that in the first week it got something like 500,000 uh, views. And I was okay. like, what the hell? Like it made no sense. I was like, this is literally nothing that like people were saying, 
I'm going to print this off and put it on my wall. It's just a list of things. Yeah. And I'm like, this is like, <laughs> I felt like it was kind of trash. So it's almost like you never know what's going to work until you actually no. put it out there. Right. And it's, I mean, there's so many, and you can probably, you can probably agree on this. There's like so much stuff that you think is a good idea that you put out and you're like, dude, this is going to kill it. And then nothing happens. Yeah, absolutely. In <laughs> fact, I gotta, I gotta say that time traveler thing I did on Twitter is literally the only thing I've ever posted on any social media. And I've been there since before social media was the thing It's the only thing that's ever done that. And I intended that to happen a bunch of times. And how did it do? Well, I mean, you know, a five year slow roll, I guess is a good one, but, and in fact, I didn't think it was going to work. Um, it, it did. That actually surprised me, but yeah, you know, you don't, you'll never know what will work. So that's how you basically, you just shotgun everything. And then, you know, the thing that you never expected, if it takes off, just keep going. Even if it's dumb, just keep going. <laughs> Even if it's dumb. Oh man. Yeah. <laughs> it's, Definitely. uh, yeah, it's, I think that's, you know, talking to, I don't know. I feel like I talk with a lot of uh, students who are entrepreneurs or creatives and stuff like that. And they're like, well, what do I do? I'm like, I'm like, I don't have the answer. Just try a bunch of shit and tell yeah, you. That's right. yeah, I'm, like, works. <laughs> I'm like, it's, it, it'd be easy. I mean, the whole, my whole podcast is like, you know, the formula, but it's, it's more of like figuring it out. Like you kind of have to go on your own journey or whatever. I hate, I kind of hate that word, but that's true. Your own you have to you have to try things in order to find out even what you like or don't like or what will work or doesn't work and then be able to change if it's if it's not adding up to what you want or not right. getting your results yeah and but it's also like when you bounce it off other people too it's like i've had dumb ideas that i thought absolutely wouldn't work that did yeah um, and that's why you got to run it by people because other people be like oh man yeah i would totally do that and you're like will you okay i mean actually like the badge thing for example and that was an idea i had but i actually i was like i don't know man and, but we kept on getting people writing in going, is there anything else we could do to help? And it's like, well, this seems dumb, but you know, it's a major business model over at Twitch and even Reddit implemented something similar, not for the same reason, but you know, basically just sort of bling and flair and digital goods or whatever. And I was like, would this actually work allowing people to show off that they helped support us? Like, would that actually fly? In? Yeah, it did. Um, we did a quick little, uh, I, I got together with our subscribers and I was like, here's what we're thinking about doing. Would you buy this? And they're all like, yes. <laughs> and I was like, wow, all right, never mind. I had no idea that was going to freaking work. Okay. So that's, you know, it's always a good idea to test the idea. Do you have a rule of thumb when it comes to, I want to say like a smell test or something where it's like before you roll it out to test it or like, is this a good idea? Is there anything that you, any process you run through or is it just kind of like, you're going to try? The, I think the closest thing I do, because the answer is mostly no, but the closest I come to it is, um, is if this works for real, am I cool with doing this forever? Ooh, yeah. that's. That's, that's pretty much the thing right there. And the reason why is because if you don't like it, it's going to be damn hard to keep going. Yeah. Oh um, uh, yeah. That's um, basically it. I've learned that lesson a couple of times. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it's, yeah. I mean, if, if it's, if it's boring, it's going to be damn hard to keep going. That's the thing. So it's a certain kind of a commit there. It's kind of like if this succeeds accidentally, would I still be cool doing it? And if the answer is no, I guess question two is, can I hire some moron to take care of it for me without my insight? And usually the answer to that's no, but apparently it works if you have a car wash. Um, so, you know, there are situations where you could maybe slot somebody else in to take it over. Um, yeah. and it still might not be a reason to do it, but the main thing is if you try something you don't want to do and it works, you're stuck. Yeah, that's tough. Cause that, man, I, uh, I've talked, I was talking with a friend of mine recently and they, uh, they have a job in a career field. They've put like 10 years in and then they're like getting there, getting a advanced degree and they are like finding out that they just don't want to be in that field anymore but they're like oh i gotta yeah gotta finish the degree i'm like no you don't <laughs> i'm like um i i think i was i think i was in albania or bosnia when i ran into this random american dude and he was like i'm just trying to enjoy this one year of freedom i get before i start this job i really hate it but you know it's like i got a degree in it so what am i supposed to do i'm like well yeah. you can uh, stop you can do something else. <laughs> it's like that. Yeah, I would recommend like, you don't have to just like jump out and abandon it instantly, but move it to a spot where you can pause it, like finish out whatever semester it is. So you don't like, you know, get a whole bunch of apps or whatever. And then, then step back. And the, the reason why is because it's not, it's not even really a hedge. I mean, I'm not suggesting the odds are you're probably never coming back to it, Yeah. but at least you could, you know, that's the main thing. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, it gives you the option to go a different direction. And I mean, it's like a test almost. It's like, 
And are you just, there's a lot of reasons why you could be not happy where you are. Is it, are you just burned out and tired? I mean, yeah. sometimes you just need a break <laughs> and yeah, then totally. you come back to it. Uh, we had somebody in my, uh, my MBA program do that where she was just, she was working for a video game company and, uh, things just got really difficult. I mean, it's something she, she could have totally handled the program in normal times, but it just wasn't normal times. And she did that. She basically, she finished out the semester and then quit the program, but then jumped back in two years later and finished it. So that's totally the way to go. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, uh, I kind of feel like people get in this. I mean, I'm also guilty of this sometimes where it's like, you feel like you have to do it now. Like there, there's, yeah. you know, there's, there's no other option. You almost oh, get, I got you. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The no other option thing matters a lot. Well, I'll give you another example too of where this is going probably. Cause this is kind of what you're saying. Um, if, if you hang out with me a lot and you listen to me talk and in fact, you can hear it too. Like you hear me talking about, you know, here's the things I'm doing to try to pull Fark around. So let me point out something. I have not succeeded yet. This could all still fail. Um, but you don't hear fear in my voice. Now, the reason why is not because I'm brave or I'm fearless. I'm not. What I have learned is, is that fear does not help me make good decisions. And in fact, I make terrible decisions uh, because you feel like, oh, my God, I've got no other option. So I'm just going to pull the damn trigger on this thing and I'm going to screw it up. Yeah. So I spent a lot of time. I, I kind of like push it all away. And, and here's why what comforts me about this. And this is how I think about it. If my company gets taken out by the pandemic, it's kind of not my fault. And that's a little bit freeing in the way because it's like, well, who could have predicted that? I mean, I, I did kind of know that something was coming, but not this. It's a goddamn pandemic. It's, it's nothing to do with any bad decision I made. If this takes us out, okay, fine. Like it, I tried hard. I took my shot and it didn't work and I can sleep well. That's how I get rid of the fear basically is by doing that. But I have discovered is if, if you do something from a place of fear, you will make fast, bad decisions. And it's a, it's a really bad idea. It's hard to not be afraid is the problem though. So I'm not advocating that. Um, the best thing to do is, um, and I actually found out that here's, here's another thing. This may be, I don't know if this is you, but I have a friend of mine who was in the same MBA program. And during the first semester at the midterm, I didn't study because I'm like, it's pass fail. No, don't get me wrong. I did all the work. I went through the classes. I listened. I mostly got it. And in fact, that got me through. I had pretty much B's the entire way through with a few A's. So that totally worked for me. But I couldn't figure out why everybody else was studying so damn hard. And what it turns out is everybody tries real hard for the first semester. And then everybody realizes they're adults with jobs and they don't need this. And then they, you know, they don't phone it in, but they kind of back it down. So I ran into the guy and he's like, I, I, he said, oh my God, I'm dying. I stayed up all night studying. He's like, did you? And I'm like, no. And he goes, why not? And I go, well, I figure it's pass fail. We've got this kind of really, right? I was like, don't worry about it, man. They're going to give us all B's. And I, I was going to give him some other reasons not to worry. And he says, hold on, hold on, stop. And I'm like, what? And he goes, you can't do this to me. And I'm like, do what? And he goes, he goes, let me, let me tell you something. He goes, I am motivated by fear. He's like, if you take the fear away, I can't function. And some people are like that. And that, if that's you, okay, that, that's a valid statement. I mean, I don't want to do that, but he's like, no, no, this is like the only way I get anything done. And I was like, all right, well then, yeah, like, I definitely don't want to take that away from you if that's what you're, you're running off of. That's totally cool. So I'm not saying I'm not saying you should like, like him, I would never tell him to not operate from a place of fear. That's, that's how he lives. And he doesn't seem to mind it and he knows it. So it's kind of like, I guess there's no downside for, for the rest of us. I think it gets in the way, but it, for some people it, it, it doesn't matter at all. So there's, there's me who doesn't, you know, have fe any fear at all. And I can function in that. Most people can't, by the way, not having fear makes you stupid. I'm really good. I stay vigilant. I, I keep an eye on it. But then there's my friend who, like, he operates only from fear, and that would incapacitate almost all of us, but not him. So I'm really speaking for the rest of us, that middle group that, that has a choice in the matter. And you may not be able to make yourself not feel fear, and if you can't, that's fine. Just work with it. Yeah. I, I, yeah, it's um... – But it might be the case that your hurry up is unnecessary. That's just a voice in your own head. Yeah. There isn't actually an external reason for it. For example, like, you know, unemployment's paying out pretty good right now. Um, and you know, so if I got laid off, for example, at like at least until the end of June, well, that's like four weeks, you know, that's, that's enough time to get some stuff moving. Um, and they might re up it, who knows, but if you actually look at like how fast do you have to get back on top of something, you got about four weeks, maybe, maybe longer if they re up it. Um, now that's not to say you should still do it as quickly as possible. You just don't have to be worried about it. I don't know if that makes any sense. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. I think that, yeah, it's a, the fear thing is interesting because, I, uh, I'm just thinking about like, I don't know. It's like, I never really, 
it's, there's not usually a lot of fear that I feel from like, uh, I guess the only thing that I really think that I feeling I get, or it's an urgency. Of, yeah, it's, I and don't it's know. It's coming from somewhere else. Basically. It isn't the situation you're in. It's, you know, I, I learned something. I'm not really good at this because my wife is like the life coach psychologist. So I, I hear this <laughs> stuff sort of secondhand, but like, I'll give you an example of something I found out about it myself, which is, this is, this is unusual as it turns out. I didn't know. But I was at a mentorship retreat, which was sort of a three-phase process, which was phase one was the person that the group was working on. There were life coaches and then mentors. And I was in the mentor slot, which is basically, you know, here's the, the life coaches spend a day or two trying to help the person figure out what's wrong. And then the mentors spend the next couple of days helping them figure out how to get out of it, which was a process I didn't understand when I first did it. But one of the things that came up, because the life coaches use this as a method, is they say, is there a voice in your head telling you to do this? And if so, who is it? And that ended up being in one of the situations that I was the mentor. And of course, this is the stage where I'm not involved, but I'm listening. And she was like, I think it's my brother. And he's up my ass about doing stuff because, and then it turns out there's some family stuff. And just plug in your own story right there. We all know how this all works, right? What I realized at that moment was, is I don't have that voice in my head telling me to do stuff. And part of it was because my parents are a little bit crazy. I won't go into it too far, but it turns out when you grow up realizing that the voice of authority is wrong, that kind of changes how you feel about authority. And don't get me wrong. I love authority. It's fantastic when they're not misbehaving. But you know, at the end of the day, it, it's really hard for that would have been the voice in my head, except that was the person who was always wrong. So I learned not to listen to it. And so I don't have anybody sitting on my own head yelling at that, but literally everybody else does. And so the thing is, is if you've got that, like figure out where's the urgency coming from. And then it's possible that that's an idea somebody else put in your head to benefit them at some other point, And maybe you shouldn't pay attention to it. Yeah. It's interesting you say that because I feel like that when, when I felt like my career kind of turned into a, like a, like a much more a route that I was happier with was when I kind of just stopped asking most of the people or even like talking to most people around me about it. I was just like, well, I'm going to go do it. If yeah. I, if I fuck it up, I'm going to, I'm going to learn a lesson and I'm going to fix it. And yeah. then I'm going to keep people are going to tell you not to try on yeah. any subject at any time. They're going to say, I don't know, man, I don't think that's going to work out. Well, this, throw that one out. Let me, let me, let me give you another example. Uh, I'm just going to be the devil's advocate here. And you know, oh, those guys are the worst. Just going to be, <laughs> yeah. I'm like, yeah. well, whatever comes after that phrase can be ignored. Yes. <laughs> I have one friend where he, st he started saying that every time we talked and I was like, dude, like yeah. I'm, I tell directly me. translates to, I'm just going to be an asshole here, but <laughs> I'm giving <laughs> you, know, you a disclaimer. Comes. Yeah. Yeah. Devil's advocates are a, are interesting just because I never really, I don't know. I never really hear someone that is. Uh, how do I say this? They're usually, helpful. yes, helpful is great. <laughs> yeah. It's like nobody, nobody helpful ever says that. Yeah. I'm just going to be the devil's advocate advocate here. This is a really dumb idea and it's not going to work. Oh, okay. <laughs> What's so bad about it? Uh, yeah. It's like, I always tell people, if you want to critique my idea, don't tell me not to do it or that I can't tell me how it might work. And answers that are beyond reality are okay here. Yeah. Cause that's what you want to hear. It's like, well, you know what, if you, you know, if you, you know, had a unicorn that farted rainbows, you'd be set. Okay, fine. Can we, can we get that closer to reality? Like what is the, what, what could be done? What is there? But you got to tell me how it, it could work. Yeah. Even if you think it's stupid, tell me how it could work. What yeah. would it take? Yeah. If in a world where this did actually work, what would it look like? Right. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So when somebody, I mean, should I ask you for advice quite a bit, I feel like, but let's imagine I never did. How do you usually frame your advice to people when they, when they approach you and they're like, Drew, I have an idea. Actually, I feel like I've heard this before. It might've been on the first time you're on the podcast, but, um, let's do a refresher. What's, yeah. how do you, how do you give, how do you, uh, advise people or give them feedback? Yeah. So I think the number one thing that I do, and I might've had a different answer because there's a second answer I used to give more often than the first is I never tell people that I think that it won't work, even if I do. Mm -hmm. um, and part of the reason why is because they might actually make it work. Like, and if you could do something that I don't think you can do, well, hell man, I don't want to be the one that tells you not to. Yeah. So that's the, the first and foremost one there is basically, I want to make sure that I don't discourage somebody before they start is the main one. Yeah. I think that also making like, Sometimes, sometimes you have to mess up before you actually 
what you have to do the dumb idea first so it can evolve yeah. into the better idea. And if totally. you never even try, it's just like you're never going to get to like the the part where you actually get to be good at it. <laughs> yeah, I'll give you an example of some advice along those lines. So uh, I'm friends with um, John Scalzi, who's a science fiction writer. And he lives nearby. Uh, he lives up in Ohio. So he and I see each other a couple of times a year because all of our friends live out in New York and San Francisco. And, you know, we don't, we don't get to hang out that much. He has an interesting advice for people that want to try to write a book. He says, write a book. He says, but he says, and he's the only one that says this, but I think, I think he's right about it. He said, your first book is your starter book. Don't expect to publish that thing. What you're doing is, is it's your starter book in order to learn how to write a book. Um, it is unlikely whatever you end up with will be useful. So be ready to throw that away. He said, but if you have an idea for a book and that's the only idea you have, write it. But understand that that's probably not going to be the thing. But he said, write your test book first. And I feel like um, cooking works like that too. Yeah. The first time you make a dish, it's never going to be the best. So that's not a reason not to do it. <laughs> you yeah. Know, you get the analogy. I mean, yep. you'll never learn how to cook the damn thing unless you give it a shot. The first version will always suck. I tried to tell the guys I do the podcast this, and I'm doing this with a guy who's a famous radio DJ, and he's good. But I told him over and over again that I wanted to promote the show 10 episodes in, not on the first one, because the first episode is going to be the worst one we did. Yeah. He's like, it's not going to be bad. And I'm like, it isn't, but it's going to be the worst one we'll do because yeah. we're going to get better. Even though you've been doing this for 25 years, we will be better. And it's true. We are better. Yeah. That's a really good point. I never heard the book thing before because I've, I've wanted to write something for quite some time and I put a lot of time and effort into, or I, not recently, but before all this crazy shit happened, um, I was putting a lot of time in. I just felt like I never got anywhere because I'm like, this is awful. <laughs> but now that you're yeah. saying it was framed in a way that's like, just write and finish something and then just yeah. plan on throwing it away. It's kind of the concept of uh, shitty first drafts by, um, yeah. and I think it's, it's, I don't know if it's Anne or Annie Lamont. Sounds exactly like that. Yeah. Yeah. So. That's because, I mean, you can, if you think about that and you, you look at it just with, I mean, I feel like that's applicable just to most careers really, or like creative Almost endeavors. Everything. Yeah. The first thing you do, well, here's another thing too. Like even if you're doing stuff for a while, like I'm a coder and I remember like, you know, there was one year where I was working on a virtual reality project in England back in 1993. And even during that year, like, and this happens, anybody who codes already knows this. If you yeah. look back at your old code, even if it was from six months ago, you will always see places where you could have done better every single time. And guess what? That happens with every field, everything you've ever done. Anybody who's done anything for 10 years will look back at stuff they did five years ago and go, man, I didn't know anything back then. That's just how it is. And you did yeah. and you're not wrong. But if you use that as a reason not to start, you're never going to improve. Yeah. So it's just like, expect it. It's fine. Uh, where, where did that quote come, come from? Uh, it's like you have to suck at something for a long time before you get yeah. to be good at it. Yeah, go suck um, for a while. That's basically it. And yeah. Actually, the best analogy for that is um, working out too. Like if you wanted to get on a good workout schedule, it's like you have to be willing to say, I'm going to go to the gym and it's going to be terrible, not painful, but I'm going to do a bad job today. But I'm going to go and I'm going to do the bad job and I'm going to be fine and you will never regret it. it uh, you gave me some great advice that actually I got into the, I would say probably the best shape of my life because of something you said, and that was hiring a personal trainer. I'm not in that shape now, but yeah. um, when I was paying that person and I was going every every day, and he'd be like, yo, where?" if I was late, he'd be like, where are you? Like, you're paying to be here. You're wasting my time. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and I'm like, I felt then obligated to be there. Do you think right. that the same thing applies to having like a some type of coach in other areas of life? Absolutely. In fact, my wife has become a life coach recently. And it's really interesting because, so I live in Kentucky and in Kentucky, if you say you're a life coach, people are like, Oh, what's that? If you say it in Silicon Valley, they already know like every tech incubator out there has one or two life coaches inside. All the tech companies have them too. Like it's actually considered to be impossible to do a company in Silicon Valley without some kind of a coaching mentorship around whether they're in your field or not. And, um, so absolutely. The reason why is they've already got it figured out out on the West coast is, is that we all could use coaching in our lives on almost everything. It would always improve us. And, uh, they've just realized how vital it is. And by the way, on your, um, your anecdote, by the way, uh, I've been telling people a follow-up story that you gave me because, uh, when you went to pick your, I always tell people that about how you, why you should get a personal trainer. But then I tell them your follow-up, which is when you pick one, pick one suited towards your personality. And you went and picked an angry black man. <laughs> <laughs> because you needed somebody who would be screaming at you. You needed an angry black man. Now, me, I don't need an angry black man screaming at me. I'm good. I like somebody who'd just be like, get out there and give it a shot. 
but you don't. And th- there's nothing wrong with either of us. Just the angry black man wouldn't work with me. Uh, you needed a little more pressure and you wisely went and found it and you got exactly the type and style of coaching you needed to make it work for you. And I thought that was brilliant. And I always tell people to do that. So good job. Yeah, thank you. I never really thought about that, but I mean, it was so, and I would add, I would add one other thing too, is see that guy was built like, uh, I told somebody else I was training with him and they're like, that guy looks like a statue of a Greek God, right? Yeah. So he's, He's, he's good. yeah, yeah. You're like he's it's putting like a his, fat chef. You're like, yeah. okay, that guy's be good at cooking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, that's actually really true. I never thought about that one either. But yeah, yeah. so it's it's finding. I, I was like, damn, if I'm gonna listen to anything with fitness, like this guy knows it. Like if you look at his entire family, they're all fit. Everyone that goes to his gym, they come out looking like like they are like they could just go do an Ironman today. So I was like, well. Why am I going to go to the, this like, you know, orange theory and train with the, and this guy was also 40 years old <laughs> too. Yeah. So why am I going to go train with this 20 year old kid that's still ripped from high school? Or I can go to this guy who's 40 and been able to maintain for 20 or for his entire life, that type of physique. So it's, it's also, you know, take, take, um, the situation into context as well. Yeah, definitely. That's exactly the way to go. Yeah. And I, yeah, I guess I did need a little bit of extra, like it's all, it was also kind of fun. Cause I talk shit back to him pretty much constantly. Yeah. Like I enjoy that banter. Like it made, it made me laugh. Um, and it made it a bit more enjoyable. Like when I'm on yeah. the floor and some ducks and the guy's yelling at me, he's like, I can't have a white man dying on my gym floor today. <laughs> and I'm like, That's I can't, awesome. I can't do another rep. He's like, I'm not going to jail for you. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, that's, <laughs> that's, that's fair. That's awesome. Yeah, that's it. That's and that's it. Like that. That's not my style. That wouldn't work for me at all. My thing is kind of like. Actually, I've got a really weird one because like I I know what my limits are. So when I say I can't do it, I'm not kidding. Um, and I, it's not because I'm stubborn. I mean, I literally and I'll try to go past it anyway. We had that the other day. We I just started back at the gym on Tuesday, and the guys like do ten pull ups, and I'm like, oh god, here we go. Uh, I got them. Uh, the last two were terrible. Uh, but I was like, okay, I, I was thinking eight. I mean, it wasn't predicting. It was just by the time I got to five, I was not, I was like, oh boy, I don't know about this. I did them all. So you always try. Um, but I really, and I, and I don't mind sucking is the other thing. Um, and that was really disconcerting because he doesn't have a lot of, uh, clients that don't care about sucking. And I'm like, nah, it's great. I don't have a problem with it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's the thing is like, if you, if you can, I mean, I don't know if we're going off, off the rails at this point, or if this is actually relevant to everything else we're saying, but if you can, like I, I tell people, like I've been I've been to swing dance events in a bunch of different countries. I still think I really suck. Like every time I dance with somebody, I just wanna. I'm like, I'm sorry, I'm awful. <laughs> <laughs> I actually like I just enjoy, like I I kind of enjoy like just practicing, and I enjoy the whole process. Really, I enjoy the people, and you know when people are like, oh, you've been to a bunch of the countries and gone to dance festivals, you must be great. I'm like you're going to be very disappointed because <laughs> I am, I'm not, <laughs> but it's like, I've accepted the fact that I'm bad and it's going to take me, I don't know, years to get good. Yeah, sure. So yeah. it's like, do I want to be good someday? Yeah. Well, I have to be okay with sucking then for a while and people being yeah. like, man, you see that guy dance? And I'll be like, yeah, I'm like, there you I'm go. Although bad. you're better than me. Cause I've never <laughs> done it. Like you blow me out of the water. That's, so. that's it's, always, it's always on a continuum. Yeah, that's that's true. It's like what's the uh what is that graph where it shows like how how long it takes to get good at something? I think it's also relevant yeah. to succeed at something as well. It's like Totally. You start, you learn a little bit, you think that you're awesome, and then all this you keep like figuring out how much there is that you don't know and you're like, "Oh my god, I am so much in over my head." And then you just kind of work your way out of it over time and you get back to like you get back up to the confidence level that you had at the beginning when you didn't actually know anything. Yeah. And that's also the argument for why you should charge a bunch of money for consulting hours because they're paying for the ramp. They're not paying for you just to do, they're not paying for an hour of your time. They're paying for an hour plus all the training you did. Yeah. That's a, Oh yeah, that's a good point. My rates are going up. Yep. (laughs) Uh, is there anything else you want to say about, you know, bouncing back after, after taking, taking some lumps or an L Anything like that? Yeah. I mean, part of it is um, going back to the fear thing for a second. Part of the reason why I'm not afraid is, is like, let's say I do fail. Well, what happens? I mean, I don't want to fail. Uh, but what happens like a week later? Where am I at? I'm fine. 
You know, I mean, I'm not happy about that happening, but there isn't any lasting permanent damage. There's no shame. You know, they're like, if you did literally everything you tried to prevent something from happening and it still didn't work, sometimes the deck is stacked against you and you lose. Like, that's just how it goes. And so part of the reason I have no fear is because that will be the situation I'm in if I don't, if I don't pull this off. Um, and meanwhile, I know what I got to do and I am appropriately worried about it. So I don't know if that helps like not feel the fear, but at the end of the day, what are we talking about when we mention failure? Really? Like you're not dying. You're not getting a limb amputated. You're in, you're probably coming out of it with a learning experience and you're going to find something else and you're probably going to bounce back. Odds are that you're, you know, this isn't the one shot you're going to have. The, if you think about it, it's like, there isn't really a dire outcome there, including the other one is, is like the thing you're most worried about is like having to explain what happened to friends and family. And they're not going to be, well, unless they're dicks, they're not going to be happy about it either. They're going to be like, oh man. And in fact, case in point to kind of wrap up this analogy, my uh, sister-in-law got a divorce a few years ago. She was married to a guy. Nobody liked this guy. Uh, she didn't know that. And she stayed in this marriage as long as she possibly could to keep it going because she was afraid of what people would say when she finally told everybody that she was going to have to get a divorce. And when she did, she was blown away because not a single person said, you didn't try hard enough. Every single one of them said, God, I'm sorry you were in that for so long, which I have had to say to people who ran businesses for too long, by the way, too. I've got a friend who rode one for two years straight down into a crater. And it was pretty obvious two years before that this was where I was going to end up. And she did it for exactly the same reason. She didn't want people to think that she hadn't tried hard enough. Meanwhile, we're all like feeling bad because she's going through it. So yeah, it's exactly like nobody's going to give you crap or I mean, anybody who does is a jerk to so get rid of them. But you're not going to have a bunch of people going, ha ha, that would, you know, you, you suck. You're terrible. No, that's not going to happen at all. Everybody's going to pick you back up and you're going to be off again on the next adventure. Yeah, that's oof. I might just wrap it up there. That was pretty good. Yeah, it's not getting better <laughs> than that for sure. It's just, you know, dick jokes and you know, alcohol for the rest of this. If we do anything else, we might as well stop. All right, that's fair. <laughs> hey, thanks for tuning into this episode. Um, really appreciate you taking the time to to check it out. Now, if you found any value in this uh, episode or in any of our others, make sure and subscribe if you're watching our YouTube channel. Uh, leave us a review on iTunes. Uh, follow us on Instagram, Facebook, whichever platform uh, means a lot to us. And, uh, you know, we'll be able to, to reach more people with some of these fun and interesting stories and guests. So anyways, thanks for taking the time and I will see you next time.